Saskatchewan Premier Bradwell will be urging U.S. leaders to green light the Keystone Pipeline in Washington, D.C. next week. The U.S. is expected to make a decision on the controversial project this spring. Question, what's the Premier's biggest challenge, though, and is Wall on side with Obama's direction? Joining me now, the Premier of Saskatchewan, Brad Wall. Premier Wall, great to have you back on the program. Well, Evan, thanks for having me back on the show. You're preparing to meet with American lawmakers next week to make a pitch for the Keystone XL pipeline. Premier Redford was down in Washington. She made the pitch. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge? Well, I met with Premier Redford yesterday as well in Edmonton, wanted to compare notes before we go down. And uh, she recently wrote an op-ed in USA Today. And, and uh, the context of that op-ed and her mission there and the work of our ambassador to her, I think, is the right context. I, I'm not sure we need to raise the economic arguments. I think they're well known to the administration. Uh, and those who are in favor or opposed to the pipeline know the economic arguments. I think what we need to do as Canadians is, is make the case uh, in terms of our own environmental record. It's imperfect. We need to do more in terms of ensuring we're mitigating the CO2 footprint of energy production and exports from our country. But our record, I would argue, is better than almost any other place in the world that is in the business of marketing oil. Although it does, as I said, it, it's, it's imperfect and needs to improve. In our case, we're going to go down with a message around coal. Because while the Americans can say, look, the, they're worried about the CO2 footprint of uh, of uh, the oil sands or anything in a pipeline, you know, they're 38 to 40 percent dependent on coal for their electricity, and it doesn't get much more, well, dirtier than that, if I may, in terms of a CO2 footprint. In Saskatchewan, we're investing 1.4 billion public dollars with support from the federal government in the world's largest clean coal demonstration project. It's not theory, uh, the stuff of theory or drawing boards. Uh, it's well underway, it's on time, and it's on budget. Uh, it'll capture 98% of the CO2, and it's be, it, from a price standpoint, it can be comparable to combined cycle natural gas. It's a potential game changer, we think, for coal, and it's because we've made this investment but here so in what, the province. So, so, so I, we want to take that story down to Washington and as well. And so what is the story? Because, you know, obviously the U.S. depends on coal. There are some doubts from environmentalists that they, they do believe the words clean coal, they say, is an oxymoron, but I, I appreciate what you're talking about when you're scrubbing, and there's a price issue there. If the U.S. adopts clean coal technology, could that further disincentivize them for the Keystone XL pipeline? Well, it might impact natural gas because they're moving towards that. I, that might be the case, but we wouldn't. I wouldn't go down there and talk about our our own greenhouse gas legislation in the province or our clean coal project. And by the way, we invite the skeptics to come down and take a look at just what's being captured there, what will be captured there. But that's really the the purpose of of going down there with this information. Really, isn't about. Uh, uh, promoting uh, any particular way, uh, form of energy. It's about explaining that we do have a record in Canada, that we're serious about the environment, that uh, it, when, you, when you buy oil from, from Canada, more so than perhaps any other country in the world, you're buying from a country that believes we need to continue to do better. We're investing many, many uh, millions and billions of public dollars and private sector dollars to try to <coughs> mitigate on CO2. And I just think we, we haven't probably, we, we, haven't, we haven't made that case. Uh, Premier Redford's right, uh, and I, now I think the, in, in the advance of the decision, we need to say to our American friends, look, we understand the concerns around the environment. Here's our record. Imperfect as it is, it's robust, it's, it's compelling, and we hope that helps uh, make a favorable but, decision. All right, there's a couple things in there I want to unpack. First of all, the link between green lighting the Keystone XL pipeline and uh, federal government in Canada doing more to reduce carbon emissions or some more uh, laws around carbon containment. Let me show you what Alison read for the Premier of Alberta said to me. I'm pretty sure that from what I heard this weekend that we've pretty much covered off the issues with respect to the importance of Keystone for energy security, the importance of Keystone in terms of economic growth. Uh, we need to make sure that we are addressing uh, issues around climate change in a way that gives decision makers comfort with the fact that they can be economic partners with us on this pipeline. My point is she's saying that those decision makers are linking those two, green lighting uh, Keystone to environmental legislation. Do you see that link going on in Washington? Well, we've had a chat about this on the House, as you know, Evan, and I, I, I do see a bit of that, and I'm worried about it. Uh, I think what what Allison is also saying is that we need to we have a record already uh, done not at the behest or request of any U.S. administration, but we have a record in clean coal or in carbon capture in Alberta or 
the environmental uh, record of, the, of this country, uh, you know, outside of Keystone, just because these are the things we brought into place in this country, domestic policy. So we need to make the case that we're doing that. We're going to do more of it. But I think we should still object, strongly object to the concept, the possibility that approval for an important Canadian project would be linked to designs from another foreign government on Canadian domestic policy. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that's worrisome. Uh, but, but making the case for our record, defending the record, presenting what we've done in the, in, on the environment in a way that we haven't done yet, in a, in a way that we have not been able to do yet, I think is uh, reasonable and it's going to be part of what but we try to do in Washington. Is that week. an implicit criticism of how the Harper government has handled pipeline politics, that the case basically hasn't been made and now you're in the bottom of the ninth? I think we've all, uh, we all could be doing more. Uh, uh, I, 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 that's, the, that's the short answer to that. It's not just the feds or the provinces involved or even industry. I think uh, this is what's changed in terms of the dynamic. It's not just energy security there. It's not just the economy there when it comes to this issue. It's these other issues around, uh, around the environment. And uh, now let's move. It's not too late. Let's move on them and make the case. Uh, real quick, the sequester. $85 billion could get hoiked out of the system. Uh, those are crude cuts coming uh, in the U.S. on Friday. Um, what, what's your take on that? Will Canada get sideswiped? Well, we may. I mean, there's already been discussion about Canadian businesses who will be impacted, who, who are involved on the procurement side with the federal government. Uh, the border is another issue. If there are a, a market, uh, uh, if the resources at the border are markedly less than what they are now, that's, uh, that'll impact the trade relationship. I think it's something we're all watching. I'm going to be asking as many people as I can when I'm down there meeting with Senate leaders, congressional leaders, and, uh, and folks in the administration what they think. Um, but I think uh, Canada should be watching very carefully what happens with, the, with respect to the sequester. Uh, two more issues real quick. Uh, and you and I have spoken about this on CBC Radio as the House. But boy, there's a lot of controversy about the Senate. Now there's the first reports coming out about a number of senators. Uh, it goes back and forth in the House. I just want your take. You know, Tom Mulcair, the NDP, says, why don't you get rid of, talk, start talking to the provinces about getting rid of the Senate altogether. If that debate went to you, the Prime Minister came to you and said, Brad Wall, what would you do? What would you do? That's a great question, Evan. As you know, uh, just prior to our party, the Saskatchewan Party's fall convention, as leader of the party, I was musing about uh, my position changing from reforming it, the Senate to having elected senators to maybe maybe it's just time to abolish the Senate. The principles of a Tripoli Senate, regional protection, provincial protection of interest within the Federation are really being achieved because over 20 years we've seen further decentralization in an already decentralized Federation to the provincial capitals. So provincial governments can provide that. Now Good. I better say provincial I better say governments can provide sober second thought or slow down federal legislation? How does that actually work? Well, uh, maybe not with respect to the specifics of federal, uh, federal legislation, Evan, but on, uh, in terms of the principle of uh, regional representation in a voice for the provinces. We've seen a lot of uh, devolution of powers from Ottawa to, uh, to the provincial capital, starting back with some of the Martin budgets, frankly. I think you could trace it back to then. And so there, frankly, is a bit of a check and balance just be, because that devolution uh, has happened. The decentralization has happened. I, I better clarify this, though, Evan. Our party convention in the fall, and we had a very open vote. I wanted to hear from our delegates chose to uh, continue with the principle, the policy of an elected Senate. So that'll be my input, that'll be my answer to the Prime Minister. Having said that, I think now is the time to have a chat about whether this institution is relevant, uh, whether it needs improvement. I think Canadians are ready for it. I'm going to check beside my box, Brad Wall, as a get rid of the Senate. Would, I, would, you, would you want to erase that check mark or not? I, I would, because I work for the people in Saskatchewan, oh, okay. and I'm, I'm bound by the policies of the party, and happily so. So I'm, I'm still promoting a reformed elected Senate. All right. Let me get your thoughts on EI. Uh, a big story this week has been the, the so-called crackdown on EI fraudsters, as uh, the government likes to talk about. At the forefront of this is a is a focus around seasonal workers. Let me just show you what the liberal, interim liberal leader Bob Ray said about this yesterday. What is taking place is not only an affront to the workers, it's not only an affront to the chambers of commerce, it's not only an affront to business groups and others which are now coming forward, it's an affront to the nature of the Federation itself. All the government is doing is saving money on the backs of the provinces and on the backs of working people. How is this uh, EI reform playing out in your province and the seasonal workers that, uh, that work there? It, it's not as big a, an issue as it is elsewhere in the country. Uh, that's the bottom line. We're not hearing a lot about it other than what's coming from the House of Commons or other regions. And we understand and respect the fact that it is a bigger deal in other parts of the country where they may have a greater number of, a greater proportion of seasonal workers in their, 
in their labor forces. I can say this though, as a province that has a labor shortage and, and an increasingly acute labor shortage, we would like to see some we have, we've called in the past for the removal of disincentives to mobility uh, because we have parts of the country, unfortunately, where the unemployment is pretty high, but happily, parts where it's basically just frictional employment, including our province, where our unemployment rate's just over 4%, and we've had some pretty good job numbers. We're grateful for that, blessed by that, but we need workers. And so we'd like to see national programs without disincentives to, to travel. Other than, uh, if we don't have that, we're going to continue to have to go to Ireland which we, it's not a have to, it's been a success story. We have a delegation of Canadian, Saskatchewan businesses going there now yeah. to get workers, but we're going to be flying right over a part of the country where there's higher unemployment. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that begs a lot of questions. So, you know, that's generally speaking our position on EI in terms of potential reforms down the road. All right. Uh, and, and there's a big issue on worker mobility and how, and how that works here in Canada. All right. I got to leave it there. Bradwell, always great to have you on the, sh on the sh program, Premier. Thanks. Thanks for your time, Evan.